The reading of God's word this morning is one verse. It comes from the book of Proverbs, chapter 18, verse 21. Hear now the word of the Lord. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruit. The Word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, I hope you know what day is coming up this week. I hope I'm not the first person to have made you aware of it. Valentine's Day always causes uh, me to reflect on the status of this gift of love that we've been given. Um, One of the biggest statistics that continues to concern me is that of marriage um, and whether they're lasting or not. Uh, The statistic continues to be that uh, one out of every two marriages these days fail. And the failure of marriages increases uh, as you add two marriages in your life. In other words, for second marriages, the average of whether or not it's going to last, it gets even worse for you third, and so on. And I know from knowing many people who have started on this journey with such passion that it burns, it burns bright, shockingly bright, amazingly bright at first. Uh, enough to cause to usually very selfish individuals, to decide to join and become one. That's a, that's a big dose of passion. So I want to reflect this morning on what, what is the cause of that passion burning so bright to begin with, becoming dim. Dim enough for, for the same two people who decided at one point to become one to now separate and become two once again. And to reflect on what may increase your chances of keeping that passion burning for a lifetime. Because I personally think it can. I think it does. I think there are many wonderful examples. Um, I'm going on my, uh, no, I'm done with my 21st year. Uh, I say done like, thank God that's over, but (laughs) I don't mean it like that. I have uh, have been blessed by 21 years, and I'm I'm looking forward to more. And and there are people in this room who, who have been blessed by double and then some. And, and they would say they wouldn't want to change it, not for the world. That there are some things, folks, um, that that the ones who have caused, um, found the magic of making love last for a lifetime. There are some things that they do that uh, are kind of simple to understand. So my goal today is for uh, for those in here whose marriages very well could end up finished within the next few years, which statistics show is very possible in this very room. For those whose marriages uh, are wanting them to last, I want to increase the chances of your knowing how to make them last. And I want to reflect on exactly how to do that. Before I do that, I want to make a disclaimer. Um. Quite often when I get into the conversation of marriage and relationships and what makes them last, I think of the singles and how folks who are single may feel like second-class citizens once 
that conversation get started, and, and I, I don't mean to do that. In fact, um, I want to make a point to you singles out there that Paul states very clearly that if you can receive the gift of being like Paul, that is, remaining single, it is actually very preferable. It's not just okay, but it is preferable. Um, you don't necessarily need someone else to make you whole. You may have the very person you need to make you whole. Uh, I, I, I conceive of all of the energy and time and resources it took to, to do the chemistry of joining MJ and I. And when I think of that energy and then the energy of she and I bringing more life into the world and the back-breaking energy it takes to successfully bring that life into the world, if you were to take all of that energy, singles, and focus it just on developing your gifts and your contribution to the world, I think you would be shocked at what you can do. Um, so says Mother Teresa. Now, who never had a child, but devoted all her life to blessing the world, and she absolutely did. Though she may not have had biological offspring, uh, many would say they are her children. Um, now, you may be single... Uh, not by choice. <laughs> uh, you may be single and are not wanting to stay that way, and that's cool too, and I have a word for you, and it's coming. Now, I want to say a word also, a disclaimer, to um, those who are divorced. If single folks feel like second-class citizens every time the topic of love comes up, then I know those, are, those who are divorced uh, may feel even stigmatized even more. And I don't want you to hear, as I preach on how to sustain your love for a lifetime, I don't want you to hear judgment from me. Um, I, have, I have a sister who is, who is a result of, of, uh, of someone who was divorced. I have several brothers who are the result of, of someone who was divorced. Uh, God has a way of redeeming any situation. I am not preaching judgment. And if, and if you're a parishioner and you're wanting to hear some judgment on those who have been divorced, you're in the, well, you may not be in the wrong, you're listening to the wrong preacher. That's not me. What I do want to do, and for those who are divorced, I want you to hear this. All I want in preaching on love that is sustainable and can last for a lifetime is to help anyone who may be facing the very pain that you had to go through to help them avoid that issue. Right? So, the story of love is so much older than anyone in here. You may, think, you may think it started with you. All things good started with you. They didn't. It is a song that has been echoing throughout time since time began. Um, now, the story began in a fellow named Adam, so says Scripture, there are some rabbis that seem to suggest that there is a part of this story missing. That if, if every little detail that, that God did were, in fact, included in Scripture, that, that this book would just be unmanageable. We wouldn't be able to handle it. So they suggested that as God was looking down on Adam, that he saw Adam just going crazy. He started talking to the animals and they weren't talking back, so he thought to himself, he needs a helper. He needs, he needs a companion. And so he went to Adam, and he said, Adam, I have, I have a gift for you. I have something for you. I'm going to create a, a best friend for you. And um, this best friend is someone that you're not going to want to take your eyes off of. And that got his, <laughs> that got his attention. Really? Yes, in fact, if you get tired of the house and you want to leave for a day or three or a week, this helper friend of yours is going to say, well, of course, honey, go. I got this place as long as you want. And then when you come back from said trip, your helper is going to have your favorite 
meal ready to go, meals that you don't even know are your favorite. You've never even tasted them before. She's going to have the place just like you want it. She's going to know how you like to be touched. She's going to know how you like to be spoken to. What words will really affirm and stroke your ego. She's going to know the way you like to spend time and how to do it with you. She's going to know when you've heard enough words for the day and it's time to just quiet down. She's going to automatically know all of that. And so... God totally got Adam's attention. He is, he is, he's hooked. He is on board. And God said, there's, there's, just, well, there's just one thing. Um, I can't do it for nothing. It's going to cost you. And so Adam's like, well, what's it going to cost me? He says, it's going to take that arm and that leg. An arm and a leg? That's what it's going to cost. So, Adam then said, well, Lord, uh, what can I get for a rib? (laughs) And that is why God took the rib from Adam, and that is how we ended up with the woman that we have. (laughs) Now, gentlemen... (laughs) Lest you think, you get what you pay for. <laughs> Lest you think that, um, that we are somehow the crowning achievement of creation, that we are somehow in God's image and ladies are not, just know this. There was a very clear succession in the book of Genesis. God was doing one work and then impressing his work by an even greater work until he ended up with man. And if that is the pattern, the very last thing he created in creation was the woman. She is the crown in creation. In fact, uh, in the garden when it was brand new and man set his eyes on the lady for the first time, no clothes in the garden, he's like, whoa, man. And God's like, that's good. Is that what you want to call her? He's like, yeah. Whoa, man, that's her. The passion burns so bright, what causes it to dim? There are, uh, the proverb says, there is power in words, great power. And for those who will harness that power, life is to be yours. And I think there are some simple, crucial conversations that need to be had. Crucial conversations that you need to have with yourself and crucial conversations that you need to have with your significant other. We're going to go through those for about 15 minutes, and then I'm just going to give you some easy life hacks, or let's call them love hacks when it comes to your partner, and then we'll close with a few questions. Crucial conversations that you need to have with yourself, first and foremost is exactly what makes for love to work. If you listen to websites and the media, they will tell you that the real trick is finding the right person. There are literally over a thousand websites that will help you um, electronically, if you will, find the right person. And if that doesn't work out well, they'll help you find the next person and they're going to make money while doing it. But in my opinion, falling in love is not necessarily the hard thing. Uh, It's happened to me in fifth grade and on and on. Finding the right person is no big deal. Um, Although there's a few things you really need to look for. It It is staying in love. It's not necessarily finding the right person. I would say it has more to do with being the right person. And it so you may be thinking folks who are in a marriage and it's getting kind of shaky, that maybe the real big issue was in your not finding the right person. But I want to encourage you to rethink that. That maybe there's more work to be, more 
more productive work to be done in the question of, are you being the right person? Uh, as a pastor, I have had the absolute privilege of speaking to folks who have been married longer than I've been alive. And I have heard more than my share of conversations to convince me of this. People that have said yes, there were times in our marriage where there were rough patches. Times when we didn't even know if it was going to last. And I will have private conversations with people who will say, I started reflecting on what I could do better. Not on how I want to change them, but, but steps I need to take to make things better. And that is what made all the difference in the world. So think of what steps you need to do, being the right person, rather than finding. That's one crucial conversation. The other is, how is it that you view love? I'm going to go through just real quick crucial conversations, and then we're going to camp out on an idea for a little bit. Um, how is it that you view love? Most people view love in this language of falling in love. I want to fall in love. And this is an incomplete picture because this views love simply as a noun as you have heard before. You can fall into a pool, uh, but you cannot pool someone, right? And though Scripture does teach love as a noun, God is love, that is a noun, um, if you just treat it like love, you are, uh, as if you just treat it like a noun, you are setting yourself up for failure because a noun is something that you can fall out of. You can fall out of a chair. You can fall out of a car. You can fall out of love if it's just a noun, but Scripture doesn't treat it just as a noun. Scripture treats love also as a verb. Very simple. Uh, yes, God is love. God is a noun. So love is, can be a noun. But for God so loved the world that He gave, which is not a noun. It is a verb. Is love for you more of a noun or a verb? Is it just a noun? If it is, then you're setting yourself up for your passions to diminish. If you make it a verb, rather, you are radically increasing your chances of your love lasting. A verb. And here's, here's why this is such good news for you. Because you're not at the whim of, of someone else in that relationship. A verb is something that you can choose every day. Every day. And it is something that you can choose to work yourself over in regard to your love. Uh, one of the best books written on the topic is um, a book called The Five Love Languages. Anyone read that book? The Five Love Languages? Uh, Dr. Gary Chapman. If you haven't read this book, it is, it is radical. It shouldn't be radical. It's a sad thing. The question that Gary Ch Chapman answers is this. If you say you love your partner... And, and your love is not just a noun, but it's a verb, it is something that you give to them, then in what concrete ways do you express your love? All right? So here's, here's a question I want you to reflect on real quick. In what specific way do you give love to your partner? Think of it. You may name a couple ways. Dr. Gary Chapman said there's five main ways that we give and receive love. And it's very important to note these, um, words of affirmation, things that you say positively, that's how you can give love. How many times with your partner are you giving words that are not affirming? Have you taken the garbage out? Right? Affirming words. Oh, you do such a good job with the garbage. Have you ever said that? Do you know what I started doing? Um, when I get pulled over by a cop, you know, we complain about police all the time, right? They're not doing their job. But when a cop pulls you over, do you rejoice that the system is finally working? <laughs> no. So I have started, when cops will pull me over, I will say, thank you for doing your job. I totally needed to get pulled over. Now, the result is I've gotten out of a few tickets, but that wasn't, that wasn't my purpose. Um, not the first few times. Words of affirmation or physical touch or gifts or acts of service. If you have someone who's always giving you a to-do list, 
right? That is someone who does, who needs acts of service. Or quality time. Now these are very important because, hear me now, hear me, this is a truth. You are, first of all, you have a love language. One of those really fills you up, whether you've diagnosed it or not. And not only does one of those really fill you up, but you are predisposed to give love in the same way that you receive love best. So if your love language is words of affirmation, then you are constantly saying nice things to the one you love. But if the one you love, their love language is not words of affirmation, you may think that you're filling their love tank, but you're not. It's not doing anything at all because their real love language is, say, gifts. Um, one of my love languages is, uh, and you can have more than one primary one. I mean, we need all of them, but one of them really gets you going. Uh, my, one of my main ones is um, acts of service. And so I'm the guy, when I want to love on my wife, naturally, I'll, you know, you'll see me washing the dishes and taking out the garbage and uh, sweeping and mopping the floor and cleaning the room and all of this. But hear me, that doesn't do anything for her. She's like, good for you. She has, uh, gifts is her main thing, and, and she likes words of affirmation too. So if, if I've spent all my time on that, and I'm thinking that I've been depositing love dollars into the bank, but I haven't, when I go to make a withdrawal, and you will go to make a withdrawal, because you need love too, if I haven't been making the appropriate deposits, guess what I'm going to see on her face if I haven't been making real deposits? Insufficient funds. <laughs> it's not there. So do you know, do you know what the love language is of your significant other? And are you being intentional at one, do you know it? And are you being t intentional about doing it? And here's a key, whether you want to or not. Whether the return's coming back or not. It's not about tit for tat. It's not you do it just to get something back. You do it because it's the right thing to do. It's your part in loving that person and becoming one with that person. Now there's another trick to it. You may have located their, their love language, but you need to ask another, another question. Am I doing that particular love language the way they like it? How many... How many movie scenes have you seen where a guy is chewing on this girl's ear and she's like rolling on her eyes like, Lord, I can't wait till this is over. Physical touch may be her love language, but not that way. Maybe all she needs is a pat on the back. Not every touch needs to end up in the bedroom. Maybe just holding her hand. Maybe just stroking her hair. Uh... If someone's love language is gifts, hear me, gentlemen. I know what gift you're going to give your wife for Valentine's Day, but is lingerie really a gift for her? Is, is an iron really a gift for her? Right? What gifts does she like? Or if you know your husband's Uh, love language is, is quality time. I mean, does he really want to hang out with you in the grocery store? Probably not. So finding out what their specific love language is and then how it is that they like it is another crucial conversation. I mean, it's uncomfortable, but fruit-bearing. It is uncomfortable to say, you know, when you touch me like that, I'm not real crazy about it. That's awkward. Awkward. It's awkward for me to sit up here and say it. <laughs> and then to follow it up with, this is even more awkward. How I really like to be touched is like this. Crucial conversations. <laughs> yes, I don't like touching your feet. 
You think you're loving me because you would let me touch your feet because my love language is touch? So what is their love language and how is it that they receive it? That's a crucial conversation that will pay off and that is making love a verb. You want to increase the chances of the passion that you have with someone staying lit. Promise you, engage. Find their love language. Find out how it is they receive it and pour into it. That'll increase the chances. Right? Um, here are some other snapshots that are very easy to receive. If you have a pen, I, I would write these down. They're, they're, they're pretty good. Um, you will increase the chances of passion staying lit if the celebration that you have for someone does not become frustration. Right? My experience is it's very common for the very thing that draws you to someone, it becomes the thing that you can't stand about them. Right? You celebrate it at one time, it frustrates you at another. Uh, in the first year, oh, he's so funny. I, he just makes me laugh. In the fifth year, it's, are you ever serious? Don't let the 80-20 rule take over your marriage. There's an 80-20 rule about everything. And the 80-20 rule in marriage, as it deals with celebration becoming frustration, is this. Probably 80% about your mate, you love. It's great. It's what drew you to them. But you start to focus on the 20% that just drives you absolutely batty. And that's all you start to focus on. The 20% that you don't like. You may see, if you start doing that, you may start to find the 20% you don't like in your spouse. You may start to see it in somebody else. And this is why people start to drift. You focus on the 20% you don't have, and someone else has it. Now here's why second marriages fail so much. Because someone goes for the 20% that's not in their spouse, and they find out, I mean, this is simple math, people. 20% is less than 80%. Why would you go for 20% when you can have 80? You have just lied to yourself. So don't let celebration become frustration. Make sure you understand when you're getting into the relationship that me is to become we. Because a lot of kids, and most of them are my age, will say something like, you know what, I just don't feel like me anymore. I just don't feel like me anymore. Well, duh. The two are supposed to become one. If you're looking for me, you've gotten into the wrong institution. Marriage is not for those who want to retain me. Gentlemen, your bathroom, do not be surprised, is going to be overtaken and everything in it will absolutely change. You will see things in it that you didn't know existed because me becomes we. Nothing is yours anymore. It is both of yours. Um, don't keep the score. Or rather, learn how to keep the score appropriately. Marriages keep score. I know. I do it. I don't know how many times we'll get in an argument and I want to win and I know something from our past that I took score with and I'll pull out the scorecard. You remember this scorecard? Right? Keep score the right way. And that is this. Rather than keeping score or record of the things that they have done wrong, you want to increase, increase the chances of keeping the passion? Keep record of the things that they have done right. And don't just remind yourself of all of the things that they have done right. Remind them. Lord, if their, if their love language is word of affirmation, that alone will blow it up. Um, interpret them. You want to keep passion going? Inter interpret your partner with generosity. That is, don't always be assuming the worst. 
You know, I have a problem of um, when, when, when people in my house do things, I start to picture them doing it. I mean, I know it wasn't me. I, know, I generally know who it was, and I picture them do it, and inevitably, I'll put a word bubble coming out of their head, and I'll fill in that word bubble. In other words, I conjure up what I know that they were saying as they did what they did. And I promise you, almost every time I create the little word bubble, I'm assuming the worst. Uh, here's what I do for my kids. What I hate more than anything is uh, leaving stuff in the sink, okay? And the worst thing, because the dishwasher is right there. It's right there. And it's not like they haven't been told, don't leave it in the sink, right? It's just one move. <laughs> and... And what, what's, what's the big thing that bothers me is the spoon with the peanut butter. <laughs> right? Because, because I can't just take that and put it in the dishwasher because it's not going to come all the way off. It's like lipstick on the coffee cup. but We won't go there. <laughs> that is some nasty, powerful stuff. <laughs> um, so... I picture my kids putting the, the spoon with the peanut butter, and their word bubble is always, <laughs> I see them saying, oh, the dish fairy will get it. <laughs> and guess who the dish fairy is? And so if I get to the sink and it's there, I'll say, there is no dish fairy! <laughs> but they didn't necessarily say that to themselves as they were doing that. No. They were... They probably just weren't thinking at all. Uh, ladies, this is, this is so often what's going on with your husband when he does something. It's not that he thought to himself something negative about you. It is quite literally, and you don't understand this because this doesn't happen to you. You guys are brilliant, and you're always thinking. There are times, as hard as it is for you to understand, when men have nothing in their head. <laughs> at all. And, and we like it. If you are driving on a trip with your man, and he is not talking, I, this is a scenario that has happened with me. Uh, don't get all steamed up thinking, he doesn't want to talk to me. He doesn't want to be on this trip with me. You have word bubbles in his head all of a sudden. He doesn't love me. No! He's just not thinking about anything. I think another reason that that's bad is because y'all can read minds. <laughs> and most of the time, you know what he's thinking, but then when he's not thinking anything, it's really weird to you because you can't see what he's thinking. And you're thinking maybe he's hiding something. He's not. He's just not thinking. The gentlemen who are laughing know that it's true. <laughs> okay, so uh, cu a couple life hacks and then we'll close. I can't, let's see. Uh, here are some life hacks, very simple, some love hacks rather. Uh, ladies, you want something very easy for the men? Here, here's what will make their tail wag and it'll be, it'll, you almost feel sorry for them because you're like, this is so easy. This is so stupid. But men are suckers for respect. If they feel like you respect them, this doesn't mean much to you and you don't care about it because it's not your thing. But respect for a guy, it's just like their tail will wag. They'll do anything. So I want you to do an experiment. This is so easy. I want you to say something that just doesn't take much energy and there's not a lot of words to it. Just do this. Just go, after they've said something to you, they've shared their thoughts with you, instead of just walking away, like, you know, just rather say this. Say, you know, that makes sense. <laughs> you will be surprised. Just something like that. That makes a lot of sense. You want to really show them respect have their tail fall off, <laughs> say this after they say something. Say, <laughs> as hard as it might be for you, you know, I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> I 
And, and if your real goal is just to have a heart attack, here's the one. You know what, honey? There is something that I really respect about you. Now, if you really want to be tricky about it, then walk away. <laughs> but you better have something to say. It'll mean the world for him. It'll mean the world. Gentlemen, here's your life hack. Okay, here's your life hack. We like to keep score. And so, let's say uh, we're going to give something to our lady. We think a big score means a big gift. So, more roses means more love given. And we like to be efficient. We like to think, well, that'll last for a while. There, I've done my work. Here's the deal, I promise you. Big gifts do not mean as much to women as they do to guys. Rather, a lot of gifts over time. I promise you, if you're thinking about giving 12 dozen roses, as, as incredibly uncreative as that is, if you will take them and rather, rather than give them to her all at once on Valentine's Day, if you will give her one, and then one the next day, and then one the next, if you will do that for 12 days, it will shock you what sort of return you'll get on that investment. She may even end up saying to you something like, hey, that makes sense. <laughs> Finally, when thinking about changing your partner, okay, let God do that. Let God be God for once. Let God be God. It'll be far more effective. There were, uh, there, were, there were two young boys who woke up and it was Valentine's Day and mom was doing a continued tradition she had of making little heart-shaped pancakes and she'd put a little you know, red food coloring in the dough and it was all cute. Uh, and so she had to do something else. She was maybe going to do eggs and she needed someone to flip the pancakes. And so she said, I need someone to help me flip the pancakes. And both boys were just amped. They wanted to do it. Well, she only needed one. So they started fighting over who was going to flip the pancakes. Fighting. I mean, here we are celebrating love on Valentine's Day, and these two are about to rip each other's heads off. And so she goes, boys, if Jesus had a brother, Jesus would let that brother flip the pancakes. And so the boys looked at each other, and one of them said, you be Jesus. What we want, what we want is quite often what gets in the middle of our love and just absolutely destroys it. And what you might want is for the other person to change. Not you, but the other person. Right? So hear me. One whisper from God will do far more in that person's ear than a month of your nagging about something. Promise you. Work on yourself and how you make love a verb with the other person. Let God work on them and you will radically increase the chances of your passion remaining. So chew on one of these questions for the rest of the day. One. Do you look more for change in your partner or you? You're the only one you really can control. You'll have more success with yourself. But answer the question. Do you look more for change in them or you? That'll answer, that may answer the question why your passion is diminishing. Or two, do you think of love more as a noun, something that you're just in, you fell into it, and you could just fall out of it? Or do you see it holistically as a verb as well, something that you give, something that is also simply a choice? Or three, what love language does your partner 
light up with? What love language could you speak more of to them? Let's pray. Holy God, we thank You for this beautiful day and we thank You for the gift of love that has for many of us taken what was once a shell of a person. Incomplete. Even some of us just lost until we met that special one. And we felt at that time more alive than ever before in our lives. But in time, Lord, we just let the burning embers of our love grow cold. Lord, we suspect that it is because of our approach. Things that we've let from the culture creep into our minds and just pull us apart. Ideas of what we deserve. Ways that our, our companion could change. Maybe we never met the right one to begin with. Lord, teach us to know that it is more about us being the right person. Inspire our hearts, Lord, for a vision of what can be. Help us to see those who have made love last a lifetime. And help us to hold them up as the gold standard for what we're reaching for. Not our, not our friends who are now divorced and, and living some life that we think we're going to want more. There's baggage with everything. God, give us the hearts that want and work for love for a lifetime. In Jesus' name, amen.